everyone. Welcome to One Mountain, Many Paths. I am Christina Tehel, the co-executive producer, along with Krista Josepha, Jamie Long, and Jacqueline Clark. And we are absolutely delighted to be here with each and every one of you today for our third week of our special One Mountain, Many Paths summer program, or week 254 of our live broadcast. In One Mountain, Many Paths, our mission is a planetary awakening in love through unique self symphonies. We are connected, we are whole, and we are expressions of the entire process of creation. Study Becoming a Future Human and the 11th Hour Courses beginning on Saturday, September 18th with myself, David Ciserci, and Jamie Long by reaching out to Jamie Long, whose email is in the chat box right now. You will find these courses on our website, onemountainmanypaths.org, I think, I believe, along with our books like A Return to Eros, the Radical Experience of Being Fully Alive by Dr. Mark Offney and by Dr. Christina Kincaid, which is now also on Audible, read brilliantly by Gabrielle Anwar. This radical book is a guide of practice to ever more deeply enter outrageous love's energy that literally drives all of reality. Use the Zoom or Facebook chat functions to say hello, to let us know where you're from, and to resonate the practices shared here today, as well as to speak your prayers. On Zoom, check that your chat settings say everyone, so we can all hear from you. Like our Facebook page at facebook.com, one Mountain, Many Paths, and be inspired by the great clips and member activities that are being shared there every week. Subscribe to our YouTube channel at One Mountain, Many Paths. If you are on Zoom, copy the links from the chat boxes, box here on Zoom and share those links on your social media channels. Now, for what to expect today. We begin with a recap from last week, then Terry Nelson will set our intention, then David moves us into our evolutionary love code, and then into our deep practice of community prayer. Then we will do something we haven't done before, and we will bring everyone on the screen as a community dive into our next special summer program workshop. The world needs your full aliveness with Terry Nelson. And to close, Krista invites us to commit our outrageous acts of love and contribute our gifts to this revolution. A few words about our special One Mountain Many Paths Summer Program. We normally receive deep transmission of first principles and first values by Dr. Mark Goffney and sometimes from Barbara Marks Hubbard. Dr. Goffney invited a group of us who have been holding one mountain, many paths, sorry, infrastructure for the last year to lead five weekly gatherings. This is week three. We absolutely look forward to Dr. Goffney's return on Sunday, September 12th. These August symphonies give Dr. Goffney a chance to fully focus on the great library, the Da Vinci Renaissance, Renaissance project to generate the new story in a great library of books and media over the next five to seven years. The great library is also a central mission for both the Center for Integral Wisdom and the Office for the Future. 
we understand we can only respond to the breakdown of all the old structures with a new story that evolves the very source code of reality itself. This annual event, the August Symphonies, is also part of our vision for a grassroots revolution where everybody is called to powerfully step in and play their unique instrument in the unique self symphonies. At the core of our revolution is a cultural enlightenment that generates a global collective intelligence of enlightenment. The realization that every person is a unique self, a unique expression of the larger field of love intelligence with a crucial instrument to play in the self organizing unique self symphony where we are responding to existential risk by telling the new universe story through the story of the emergence of the new human and the new humanity and by participating in the fulfillment of homo sapiens as homo amor. This week, we are going to be led by Terry Nelson, a longtime friend of Dr. Mark Goffney, a generous supporter of One Mountain Many Paths and a scholar of the Center for Integral Wisdom. Terry was a chief trainer for LifeSpring, large group training, personal development, and human potential movement. Terry will invite us to discover in what ways we are holding back in our life force, energy of Eros, and how we can step into the fullness of our radical aliveness. This is at the core of the political and social revolution of love. Now, we turn to the recap from the prior week's One Mountain, Many Paths broadcast. Last week, Claire Molinar and Shahat Corden guided us to more fully embody the teachings and the practices towards our unique gifts. Can we be innocent, fresh, deep, and mature at the same time? How are our deepest joys and our deepest pains related to each other? Think about it. It is absolutely true. Our joy and our pain are the intersection of our unique gifts. We live towards what matters to us. We embody the values that are important to us. Our unique gifts are not a static thing. They evolve. They mature as we grow, as we practice daily, as our devotion to our outrageous love and our outrageous pain deepen. Growth needs continuous practice. It is our turn, my outrageous friends. Practice never ends. Practice is everything. We practice until our last breath. Practice is psychoactive, where we feel awake, alive, energized, even in situations that are difficult to navigate. We feel fully from the inside of all our life situations. We get the Dharma in our toenails. We are coming together, generating the planetary awakening and love through unique self symphonies, pooling our knowledge, accessing the deepest visions of this cosmoerotic universe and telling this new universe story. We are willing to practice outrageous evolutionary love as our sacred creed. With that, I invite us to more deeply enter into the sacred and holy space of one mountain, many paths, and I turn my word to you, Terry Nelson. When my father died several years ago, 
Uh, I wasn't at his bedside, but my younger sister, Allison, was. And Allison said that in that last hour, dad would take a breath and then with some struggle, let it out. And with more struggle, take another breath. And in that last hour, she listened to each breath come in and then go out. And Allison said, and finally, after that hour, there were no more breaths. It's like dad stopped. Dad had just stopped. Now, I don't know about you, but as I notice today, I look at uh, our climate problems. I'm in central Oregon right now, and if I look out my window, I can see smoke as the fires are not too far away. I had this sense of democracy under attack. COVID, you know, with all of its struggles, both the health and political. And now Afghanistan. I can't even watch the news anymore about Afghanistan. I feel so bad. And as I look at all this stuff, uh, I have this, this you know, uh, unbidden, as committed as I say I am to everything in life, I feel this pull to uh, withdraw and maybe like just hide under my bed. Uh, and I forget to be grateful that I'm alive and I'm in the game and I still get to take the next breath just to celebrate and take in my next breath. So now, I invite you to join me in being grateful, even thrilled to be able to just breathe in spite of all that's going on in the world. Uh, so if you would, just very briefly, please close your eyes and then focus on your next three breaths. I mean, really focus on it, that you get to do that. And not like, you know, my dad that all of a sudden stopped. You get, I get to take the next one. And uh, I invite you to be joyful, grateful that you get to take this breath. And uh, maybe even any time you're reading the news, you just stop and go, I'm still in the game. I get to take this next breath. And with that, as I'm talking to you today, I'm aware that I've got more life behind me than ahead of me. I'm also aware that my two kids have the opposite situation. My daughter, Megan, has more life in front of her to unfold, and my son, Topher, has more life in front of him to unfold than I have, and I'm aware of that. So one more uh, little story. On the evening of 9-11, having been rocked by the events of the day of 9-11, having been shocked by the events of 9-11, I was reading Topher a bedtime story. He was about four then. And I, I fell half asleep and I started to have this, I guess I call it a waking dream. And I looked down at Topher there asleep and I imagined that I was looking at his dead body having been killed in the events of 9-11. And it was, it was awful. And in the midst of that half dream, I choked out a, a, a kind of a prayer that said, please, just one more day, please, just one more day with Topher. Just give me one more day. And so uh, as I start here this morning, uh, I say to all of you, please, just one more day. And uh, here we are today in One Mountain. My commitment in life, which I always share whenever I speak with people, is that I, I'm committed to your epitaph. That's what my life is about, your obituary, your eulogy. And my commitment is that it say what you want it to say about the meaning of your life. And that it not say, whoops, or gee, I sure wish, or if only there were more time, or I regret that. So my commitment is that your obituary say what you want it to say. My intention today is one, that you radically transform yourself into being homo amor, living with radical aliveness forever, to have it matter uniquely that you lived at all. That's one. And two, if I don't get that done, <laughs> if I fall short of that, 
then I'm at least hoping to offer you some ideas that might be helpful whenever you might be choosing to withdraw or to fully contribute your unique gifts. Whenever you might be making a choice that might enhance your aliveness or diminish it, I'm hoping to offer you some ideas that might be helpful to you. So I now turn to David to uh, uh, do the code. David? Thank you so much, Terry. Beautiful invitation, friends. Let's breathe into Terry's invitation to live as homo amor. And as I resonate the code, this is a code that Terry chose as a framing for this workshop. It comes from Dr. Mark Gaffney. Let's really feel it, settle into our bodies. You know, one thing that I remember, I'm so grateful for Mark uh, for teaching me, is that you know, aliveness doesn't just happen. Right? It doesn't just happen to me. I actually, I actually choose it, right? And I actually choose to step in and participate in it. So I'm so delighted to participate in this radical aliveness with all of you, friends. And Terry, it's an honor. This week's evolutionary love code. Eros is the experience of radical aliveness, seeking ever deeper contact, ever deeper intimacy, ever larger wholeness. Radical aliveness is life. We yearn for life. But when we are deadened, we move to kill life as a shortcut to genuine aliveness. The murder of Eros is sourced in the failure of Eros. We cannot become homo amor until we transcend the impulse to murder Eros. To transcend the impulse, we must fearlessly recognize it. So friends, we're gonna go into amor, where we actually can chant to invoke this aliveness within ourselves. So friends, let's, Let's go inside to a more. We have, I believe, Oriana and the gang. more. So friends, let's continue to deepen our invocation here. As we turn toward the source of our aliveness, 
we turn toward the ultimate reality, the source of all things. So we turn to God, we meditate to enter prayer. And who is God, friends? Remember, this isn't the God that you don't believe in. We don't believe in the God who is a homophobic, ethnocentric vending machine in the sky that gives us what we want when we put in the right prayer and is owned by one religion. That's not who we're praying to. We actually pray to the infinity of intimacy that we can access through different three perspectives. So the three faces of God, the three faces of the one, the three perspectives of ultimate reality. First, we can look at the third person face of reality, which is the force that binds all things together. The force of outrageous love that actually ties the entire fabric of reality together, the great web of life. We actually can, can look around and actually see the magnificence, the intelligence of nature, the force that actually creates all the ecosystems and that holds everything in, in elegant balance. That force of arrows that moves from, from matter to life, to complex life, to human life, to consciousness in humans. So friends, we can see God in the third person through all of the deep sciences, deep ecology. We can see it through the mysteries of quantum mechanics. We can see the third face of God in the mycelium in the forest, which is the root system of mushrooms that bind all of the roots of, the, of the, all the trees in the forest that just when the perfect conditions are met, suddenly mushrooms flourish and actually recycle life in the ecosystem. All around us, we can find God in the third person. We can also find God in the first person, right, within us. So all of that dazzling complexity, that beauty, that power, that arrows actually lives in us. We can settle into the closest the part in our deepest heart where we can feel that silence, that stillness. But then out of that stillness, we recognize that we are evolution having a unique experience. I am God in evolution evolving through David. You are God having a unique experience. We can actually see that we have unique configurations of Godness, of love that is showing up that never was, is, or will be ever again. Feel that aliveness, friends. We're invoking the ultimate here in our first person. We can feel that desire to reach deeper contact, ever greater intimacy, ever greater wholeness, as Dr. Mark always invokes in us. We feel that. We feel that the God in the first person, right? There's so many ways we can access. And finally, we turn toward God in the second person, the God who holds us, the personhood of reality, the God we can turn to and we know that we're never alone, the God that is our father, our mother, our brother, sister, our companion, our beloved, that looks at us and just is madly in love with us. God who is the infinity of intimacy. We can say, God, here I am. This is who I am. I show up and know that God will always love us madly. We can feel embraced by the infinity of intimacy that gives us our very aliveness. So friends, as we go into prayer, we're going to go into Leonard Cohen. And we're going to do this a little differently. During the Leonard Cohen song, as we invoke God in second person, and we pray and we sing, we're going to actually invite everyone closer. So Suzette is going to invite everyone to step up as a panelist for our workshop that Terry is going to facilitate in just a minute. And when you're invited, you can just click, um, you know, become panelist. And make sure you mute yourself so that you stay muted until you're actually ready to talk uh, later in the workshop. But we want to invite everyone in, and you don't have to participate, but we're inviting everyone in to, put, to actually be on the panel um, to actually be seen by Terry, right? So you won't be actually um, directly on camera, but Terry will be able to see you, right? So friends, let's, let's continue deepening our connection with God here as we're invited closer into the holy and broken hallelujah. Suzette. Take this inside. Now I've heard there was a secret chord that David played and it pleased the Lord. But you don't 
really care for music, do you? It goes like this, the fourth, the fifth, the minor fall, the major lift, the battle king composing. Friends, let's turn to the chat box and ask for everything. And if you can't hear me, if my sound is crackly, then read it yourselves. But here we go. We're going to go into the chat box. We're going to pray for everything. Turn to the infinity of intimacy. Here we are. We have Jacqueline. I pray for the safety and well-being of all women and girls in Afghanistan, that they may feel loved and cared for. Amen. Krista, I pray for people in Afghanistan 
to find peace, a safe place to rest and come home. Amen. Kirsten, I pray to be able to fully embody my passionate eros, outrageous love moving in me, through me, and as me, and to give my unique gifts without holding back and without losing myself. Yes, Kirsten, when you do it, we can do it as well. Becca, we have Shanti. I pray for all the people in Afghanistan, New York, Friesland, and anywhere else there is collective pain to feel our outrageous love and the universal welcome. Amen. Benjamin, thank you so much for holding and accepting my evolving unique self. Guide me to refine and expand what relationship really means. Timothy, I pray we realize and achieve our greatness as arrows alive. Yes, Timothy, Becca, joy and recognition by all beings of our divinity. I pray, says Chahati, to become more and more intimate with the pain and the, and the pleasure and joy of existence. Yes, Andre, I pray for all of us to feel God's love. Yes, right here. Christina Tahel, I pray for water, for water to heal this world, for clean water, for water to teach me how to flow and how to bring life. Yes, amen. Vashti, I say yes to radical aliveness in me now and pray every being says yes now that empowers evolution of arrows on planet Earth. Yes, Vashti, we're with you in that prayer. Tom Ronane, I pray that each and all of us may have the epitaph for which we deeply yearn. Yes, Joycey, I pray for those in the path of the hurricane on the U.S. East Coast. May they be safe. Amen. Shahati, more and more intimate with pain and joy of existence. Yes, Carl, welcome, Carl. I pray that we become a safe harbor for all in need. Amen. Suzette, I pray for the continued unfolding of this great unique self symphony. Yes, and you're such a key player, Suzette. Thank you. Amen. Raquel, I pray for feeling safety and relaxation. Lynn, I thank you for assisting us as we assist in you clearing the air, purifying the water, emanating love throughout the universe. Yes, Lynn. G. Mag, I pray for health for my family and the entire community. I pray for more awareness of radical aliveness. Yes, G. Mag. And Michael, I feel held and loved. Thank you all for your intimate and powerful prayers. Yes, Michael, and we lift these prayers to the sky in an offering to the infinity of intimacy. And I turn my word to you, beloved Terry. As a start, as a start, I, I invite all of us to consider that living is not the same as not dying. And you know, we, we human beings, and, and I certainly include myself in that group, get that mixed up. We seem to be thrown to spending a lot of our energy on not dying. Today, I'm hoping to offer you some insight to be able to transcend the impulse, as David said, to transcend the impulse to murder Eros, our own Eros. Now, as a start, uh, again, I, I'd invite you all to grab a pen and a paper if you got it nearby, or if you just want to use the, your keyboard, you can also do that and enter it on chat. But as you do that, I'm going to ask you to think about yesterday, you yesterday, as a matter of fact, and sort of see yourself going through your life yesterday. Uh, you know, interacting with people, being by yourself, your physical engagements, your, your emotional engagement, whatever. Just kind of review your participation in life yesterday. And, uh, you know, were you fully 100% engaged or were you something less? Did you hold back? Were there risks you knew you probably should take, you didn't take? Were there risks you knew you should take and you did take? So I'd like you to just to review yourself, you being and doing you yesterday. And on a scale of one to five, one being, you know, barely there, five being full 100% radical aliveness, how would you rate yourself by your own standards? How would you rate yourself in your life yesterday? Just kind of think of that. One, two, three, four, five, how would you rate yourself? And I kind of bring a number to mind that you would, you know, honestly give yourself. And how many would say that you were at a five, a full five? Can I see your hands on the screen? How many at a full five yesterday? 
Okay, couple. How many about a four yesterday? All right, some more. How many three? How many about a three or even less than three? How many would rate yourself less than three, three or less? Okay. Now, human being, friends of mine, I want you to notice that. So by your own standards, you said, you know, I most of us, it looks like it was about a 3.5, I would say, <laughs> was the average for our group. And I would say this is probably a more you know, more participation than an average group, given that you're even here today, it says something about you, but about a 3.5. So yesterday, notice by your own standards, you held back at least some. You didn't live, you know, sort of full out radically alive, you know, uh, uh, yesterday. So um, you didn't fully live quite yesterday, you held back some. So my question is, what are you going to do with the unlived life from yesterday? What are you going to do with the unlived life yesterday? I mean, do you have like somewhere a bank savings account you're, you're keeping, keeping it in or, or saving up for a rainy day? And, uh, you know, I always have this image that comes to mind of, uh, you know, we get to the pearly gates of heaven. And for sure, when you get to those gates, there's going to be a guy with a clipboard, you know, checking you in or not. And you say, OK, um, on my behalf, uh, here's all the life I didn't live in this savings account. Do I get credit for it, you know, sort of to get into heaven? You know, and I, I can't prove it to you, but I don't think you get credit for it. And as a matter of fact, if, if God would show up in that moment, uh, he might be really irritated or angry at you or us. You know, he might say something like, dude, I gave you this gift of life. What did you do with it? And you go, well, not a lot, but I got a lot left over. I saved it. You know, I, I, I think, you know, he might be angry at you with, you know, for holding all that unlived life in that account. Now, a lot of smart people suggest that the way we human beings handle this most fundamental existential dilemma we have, that is, of being creatures who wish to continue to be, but one day will cease to be, the way we handle our fear of death is by not living. And if we think if we hold back from living, you know, uh, maybe we can get out of this alive. We can get credit for that bank account. We think if we don't fully live the life available to us, maybe we won't die. As said in Ernst Becker's prize-winning book, Pulitzer Prize-winning, The Denial of Death, it's a terror to have emerged from nothing, to have a name, a consciousness of self, deep inner feelings, an excruciating yearning for life and self-expression, and with all this, yet to die, and with all this, yet to die. So we hold back as a part of our strategy to survive, to get out of this alive. And remember, a strategy is a plan, a way to win a game. I'm not sure why we human beings use this strategy so commonly, because it doesn't seem that it's ever worked for anyone else. Why would we think it would work for us? Maybe we should reconsider this strategy. One of the great illustrations uh, of this is found in Charles Dickens' classic, A Christmas Carol. Now, the main character, Ebenezer Scrooge, grew up as kind of a lonely young guy. The story is his mother died in childbirth and his father just withdrew from him. And some point in that process, Scrooge decided he wasn't lovable and the world was a cruel place. And based on that, he developed his strategy for survival. He withdrew from people. He became, you know, totally miserly gathered his great fortune, but didn't give it with anybody. As a matter of fact, I looked up in the dictionary, the word Scrooge, it's so common, it, it means the definition is a miserly person, all right? And it comes from this book. So Scrooge's strategy to stay alive was to kill his own eros, to totally withdraw, to wall off, 
I mean, think about this. The way to survive is to kill off your eros, is to deaden yourself. Uh, now, his response when asked to care for others was bah humbug. His strategy to survive was to kill his own love, his own aliveness. Now, in looking at Scrooge, consider the words of uh, Robert Nozick. He was a Harvard philosopher, wrote a book called The Examined Life. And Nozick, he says, mostly we tend to live on automatic pilot, he said, following through the views of ourselves and our aims that we acquired early with only minor adjustments. This situation, to say the least, is unseemly. Would you design an intelligent species so continuously shaped by its childhood, one whose emotions had no half-life and where statutes of limitations could be invoked only with great difficulty? Now, as you probably know, especially in this congregation, uh, our ego's job is to have us survive. And the way it has us survive, its modus operandi, is to be right about our beliefs, forgetting that we just made them up in the first place, including beliefs like, I am not lovable, or I don't matter. And we will fight to the death to be right about those to prevent ourselves from dying. That's crazy. And the more we stay an automatic pilot about our beliefs, the more we lose our own aliveness. Well, one Christmas Eve, a team of ghosts, back to Scrooge, well, I'm going to say to you, they weren't really a team of ghosts, but rather a team of outrageous and committed One Mountain members, you guys, uh, who were not willing to be written into the book of life until Scrooge was too, sort of the culture we're in here. Uh, and they stood for Scrooge to transcend his impulse to kill Eros in order to live. First, the One Mountain member of Christmas past took Scrooge back to when he made that decision to be not lovable and had him fearlessly recognize he made the decision. And then the One Mountain member of Christmas present had Scrooge wake up and see what was going on around him to wake up. And then the one Mount member of Christmas future took Scrooge into the future to view a gravestone and to see a name on the gravestone, Ebenezer Scrooge. Finally, Scrooge did not look away. Scrooge was shocked. His strategy to not die by not living uh, was not going to work. He was going to die. Then on Christmas morning, after all this, Scrooge woke up and was transformed. He was radically alive, and he spent the rest of his life seeking deeper contact, deeper intimacy, and ever larger wholeness. In getting death, in getting out of the denial of death, comes the possibility of radical aliveness. Another illustration found in Tolstoy's War and Peace. In War and Peace, there was a character, Pierre, who was a Russian, even though his name was Pierre. And this was the Russian Napoleonic War. And for the first 500 pages of War and Peace, Pierre is at about a 2.3. And then he's captured by the French and he's fifth in line to be executed. And over the course of a few days, while he's in jail waiting to be executed, He's thinking about being at a 2.3 and withholding in life. And then pow, he's fourth in line to be executed and he's thinking about his life. And then pow, he's third in line to be executed. Pow, second, pow, he's next. Pierre began to get it. He was not getting out of this alive. His strategy was maybe bankrupt. Now in the story, and there's a reason War and Peace is such a classic, and this is one of the most classic of moments in capturing humanity. In the story, he's saved at the last minute, and for the rest of his life and the rest of the book, Pierre's at a full five. So again, out of getting death comes the possibility of radical aliveness. Now, another illustration, Kafka, the trial. 
Now, the trial is kind of a crazy book. Overall, it's a story about a guy who's on trial by his own conscience for what he's made of his life. But there's a parable in there called the parable of the gatekeeper. And the parable is about a young man who goes to the city to study the law. And the law is held in this large building. And in front of the door to the building is a large guard. And the young man goes to the guard and says, guard, I've come to study the law. Let me pass. And the guard says, sorry, you do not have permission to pass. And the young man looks like he's about to run past it and go for it, you know, past the guard. The guard says, whoa, young man, should you get past me, there's another guard and another door. And beyond him, a third guard and a third door. And even I am afraid of the third guard. And the young man goes, okay, all right, I'll be back tomorrow, next day. I've come to study the law, let me pass. Sorry, no permission goes home, comes back third day. All right, so third day goes back, same litany. I've come to study the law, sorry, no permission. Fourth day, fifth day, a week, a month, a year. And uh, same litany, time passes over and over again. And finally, later on, uh, after time, so much time, the young man is now an old man. One more time, I've come to study the law, let me pass guard no permission but this time the young man now an old man turns and stops like he's been hit by a bolt of lightning and he says oh my god what an idiot i have been all these years it couldn't be that important to study the law because there's never never been anyone else but me around this door and if it were important to study the law there'd be all kinds of people trying to get in here Oh no, how stupid I have been. Now the guard looks at him and doesn't see this revelation at all and looks directly at the young man and says very soberly, of course, there's been nobody else here but you. This is your door. This is the door through which only you can pass. Lock the door and left locked the door, and left. You know, and in thinking about that, I, I would ask myself and all of us, where do we get permission? Where do we seek permission to live our lives with radical aliveness, to be our unique self and our unique gifts? The psychologist Carl Jung once said, there's nothing more psychologically impactful on the lives of children than the unlived life of their parents. Now, let us begin as we started with a short meditation. I invite you to participate, let yourself fully participate, if you will, even though this is kind of a quick entry into a meditation. So if you would, close your eyes and then just follow my directions. Take a deep breath, let it out slowly with a sigh. And then, Imagine yourself first awash in a red light. And as red washes over you, your body calms. Red changes to orange. You're drenched in orange and your emotions calm. Orange changes to yellow and your mind quiets as yellow washes over you. Yellow to green and you feel vital and healthy as green washes over you. Blue washes over you and you feel your love merging with the love of other people. Blue switches to purple, you're awash in purple and you allow yourself to want what you want, to have your aspirations and your dreams. And finally, violet. Violet washes over you and you have a deep connection with everyone and everything, a sense of oneness. And in that state, I'd like you to bring to mind somebody in your life that you know cares about you. Somebody in your life that loves you and cares about you somebody who totally wishes you well, somebody who totally doesn't want you ever to suffer. And imagine that person going through their life somewhere right now. Maybe they're reading a book. Maybe they're taking a walk. Maybe they're having dinner. Just kind of notice this person, this person who cares about you. Notice this person all of a sudden smile. And as you see this person smile, you know they just thought about you. This person just thought about you and smiled. Just have this moment. 
All right, take another deep breath, let it out slowly with a sigh. And then imagine this very same person is now seated right across from you in a chair, like in a dyad, and they're looking right into your eyes. And just have this moment of this person who cares about you looking at you. Let it be real in your imagination. They're right there, sense it, feel it. And then you hear this person looking at you and say out loud to you, I choose you. I choose you. And just have this moment of being chosen by another human being. Just feel it, sense it. I choose you. What a joy that somebody, just acknowledge it, admit it. I choose you. And then as you look at this person, you kind of have a sense of behind them, a line of people extending far into the past until they blur into the past whole line of people way into the past. And then on the other side, you see a line of people till it blurs into the future. Huge line of people into the future, huge line of person into the past. And now this person looks at you only now doesn't say I, this person looks at you and says, we choose you. We choose you. And as a matter of fact, you're the one we've been waiting for. You're the one we've been waiting for. All right, take a deep breath again. Let it out slowly with a sigh. Allow yourself to be awash in violet light. Violet changes to purple. You're drenched in purple. Purple changes to blue. You're washed in blue. Blue changes to green. Green switches to a yellow light washing over you. Yellow to orange. Orange to red. Take a deep breath, let it out slowly with a sigh. Allow your awareness to return. Open your eyes when you're back and just notice your experience. And in conclusion, Meister Eckhart once said, if the only prayer you ever had to, to say was thank you, that would suffice. So thank you. So thank you. And from me to you, know that I have certainly gotten better than I have given. And to you, I am grateful. All right. Krista, let me turn it over to you. Wow, thank you, Terry. I just had tears in my eyes with that example of standing by the door and feeling what our unique contribution is. So I want to invite all of us to take this journey into your body as you listen to this music, as we transform from being held back by all of these things to stepping into our full power and our full arrows and our full joy. Doing it that way, did 
wait and listen to the things my heart would say, letting fear take over and decide. But then I realized that the choice was mine. I could feel the shift. I began to shine, living an empowered, beautiful life. I am not who you think I am. I am so much more. I am one with swords. I am limitless, infinite, powerful, abundant, complete from the start, creator of all I am. Yeah, and so let's just feel for a moment the power of this energy that is between us, the power of the transmission of the Dharma, how precious it is what we are holding here together. And thank you so much, Terry, for giving that amazing transmission, your unique transmission, your voice, your teaching, your wisdom, and touching all of our hearts. And deepest bow and gratitude, of course, to our teachers, Barbara Marks Hubbard and Dr. Mark Gaffney. And Dr. Mark Gaffney, who is articulating this new story that we have this language that we can, that gets to be together in this way, this transmission of the, lin the lineage that we are holding together. We are receiving it here every week. We can remember, we can remember, we can drink it in. And then the question is, what are we going to do with it? So we receive, but we also have a responsibility and even an obligation. And we're going to speak about unique obligation next week in Tom Goddard's workshop. So we also have an obligation and a responsibility to say yes, to step in more and more and more and deeper every time and every week. So I want to ask all of us to imagine how can we bring this dharma into the world? What can you do? What is your unique contribution? What is your door where, where you are knocking on your whole life? What is your unique door? And how can you contribute to sharing this beautiful transmission of outrageous love with the world in your unique corner of the world? So whatever comes up for you right now, maybe you can think of a friend that you want to invite into this holy sacred space and you want to call up that friend right afterwards and you want to tell them how beautiful and precious this was and excite them to come here to join us next week so their hearts can be blown open by this love. Or maybe you want to look up one of our beautiful videos on YouTube and you want to share that one with a friend or you want to share that on social media or on your Facebook. Whatever is your unique way is help, step in, say yes. And I can tell you from my own experience being here now, for a couple of years, but a year and a half really stepping in deeply, that the best way to let this Dharma transform you is by stepping in and making your contribution because that's the way that you get to let it move in you as you and through you, where you actually get to live and embody and practice the Dharma. So this is my invitation. And of course, a very, very, very practical way of doing that 
is by becoming a member, by becoming a member and contributing your resources and your money to this revolution. We are taking gigantic steps to bring this one mountain to the next level. We're going to publish books, all the evolutionary sermons from 254 weeks are being transcribed and edited. And we can all see our beautiful Joycey here on the screen who is leading that whole project. Hundreds of, of transcripts are being transcribed and edited and turned into books. So that is over 20 books that we're trying to publish. So whoever wants to step in and help Joycey, please reach out and help us edit and transcribe and make all of that happen. And of course that is led also by Christina to help Emlong. So that's one way. And the other way is that Jacqueline and me and Jamie were working on uh, launching One Mountain also as a podcast and we can really help use your help with that, but also your funding, your contribution. So we can really push that and bring this beautiful dark into the world so step in and become a member and as a member i say it every week um, if you go to one mountain many um, and click on membership here you can find all the beautiful benefits that you will have as a member also because you get access to these nine beautiful in-depth courses and we're going to study becoming a future human together as a member study group so that is an amazing way to also come closer to the community and get to know each other and practice and embody the Dharma even more. You can choose your own contribution, which you can see here. And again, I recommend giving as much as you possibly can because that is simply the most joyful thing to do. So thank you all. Thank you all for your attention, for your energy, for your love. We are the space holders. This is the circle. This is really ours to do. So let's blow it out together. We're going to listen to our beautiful song, How Deep Is Your Love? And it's a dance song. It's a celebration song. It's a song filled with eros and aliveness. So if you are up for it, get up your chair and let's dance it out together. No inhibition. No sin. 